Well, good morning, Walden Church. I hope you're having an enjoyable summer, and we are kind of heading into our last few weeks of this sermon series on our summer playlist. Every single week, uh, we're just taking on a different topic. And this morning, I'm starting with uh, probably a very famous proverb, right? A saying, time heals all wounds. You've heard that before right? The proverb, time heals all wounds, may be first attributed to the Greek poet Menander, who lived around 300 BC. He said, time is the healer of all necessary evils. And then there's a poem written in the 1380s by Chaucer, which says, as time may hurt, time doth also cure. It's this idea that as time goes by, the past becomes more and more faded, and eventually those things that hurt us, those moments that scarred us, they disappear. We forget about them, or we just don't think about them as much. But consider the analogy. Is it really the truth? Does time heal all wounds? I mean, I have a a scar on my shoulder. Uh, It's been there since I was a baby. I have a bump on my forehead from when I was in a car accident and my head hit the driver's side window. None of those have healed by the passage of time. Instead, they serve as reminders of the past. And, and, and what if I just neglected a wound? I mean, if I had a bee sting or a splinter under my skin, is it best to just ignore it and say, well, Time heals all wounds. What if there was a broken bone or a severed limb? (laughs) Just, Just ignore it, right? Time heals all wounds. No, of course not. That sounds silly to us. Of course you would seek medical attention. But what about an emotional scar? What about a fractured past? What about a broken relationship? I mean, why do we allow those things to remain unexamined, and unchecked, and we leave them in the past. The passing of time doesn't make them go away. Whether it's real or emotional, we let those memories and those past hurts just stay back there. Well, because they're in the past, right? They're in the past. We've already left that place. We're going on to new places, right? To go back, you have to to, 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 to stop making progress forward. I don't want to fix things if I have to go back. I saw this week there was a question posted on Facebook, and it said, would you rather go back in time if you could fix all of the mistakes in your life, or would you rather have $10 million? <laughs> and I thought, you know, with $10 million, I could probably easily forget all my past mistakes. But that's just it. I mean, to fix the mistakes, you would need to go back. And some people can't go forward, can they? They, they, they have to go back and fix those mistakes. Something happened and so they, they go and they seek out someone to talk to, an expert or a counselor or a physician or a psychiatrist, and that person will begin to ask them questions about their past. How was your childhood? Tell me how you were raised. And I think, again, one of those reasons that maybe more of us aren't in therapy is because it feels like defeat. It feels like you have to go back. And if I go back, then I'm losing, right? Then I've lost. If I have to go back, I'm not moving forward. And life is about moving forward. Joanna and I are gonna take a a small trip tomorrow just to get out of the house and, you know, as the man, of course, I'm gonna gonna mark our progress by all of the things that we pass, right? Because what happens when you stop for gas? What happens when you stop for a drink? Everybody else is getting ahead of me. Of course, that also happens when I miss my exit, right? And then I have to go further up the road, turn around and go back. And I think to myself, ah, I'm losing time, right? Going back feels like losing. It feels like defeat. 
I mean, the whole point is to, right? The whole point of life is to move onward and upward. But you know, the Bible is full of stories of men and women who had to go back in order to go forward. I mean, think about Moses. Moses was a prince of Egypt, but in a, a fit of rage, he killed a man and he was, he was exiled. And he had to go live in the desert wilderness and he was reduced to being a shepherd. And then he carved out a good life for himself. And he had a wife and kids. And then one day God said to him, Moses, I'm gonna send you back. King David, he wanted something that wasn't his, another man's wife. And he exercised his power to take her and to erase her husband. And everything would have been fine. He probably could have easily gotten away with it. Until one day God said to him, David, you can't ignore this pain that you've caused. You need to make it right. David had to go back. Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. But when Jesus got in trouble and the heat was on, Peter shamefully turned his back on his friend and even denied that he knew Jesus, not just once, but three times. And Jesus wasn't there. Nobody witnessed that event. And so when Jesus returned, Peter probably felt his indiscretion would remain in the past. Nobody would ever know. But Jesus wouldn't have that. And he said, Peter, do you love me? Jesus takes Peter back. And he allows him to wrestle with the shame that he feels. Today, I want to look at another story about going back and facing your past. And it's found in the book of Genesis. Now, if you're new to the Bible, uh, just turn to the front and then just move in a couple pages. We have a creator. He is the eternal God. He created the world. And the very first people uh, are a part of this story. And you descended from that same story. It's not an American story. It is not an ethnic story. It is a global story. And I know the Bible is often referred to as a book, and we mistakenly think it's some sort of religious instruction manual that tells you what to do and what to believe, but it's actually a library of 65 books that took 1,500 years to write. In fact, there is even 400 years of silence between the first half and the second. The Bible is a narrative. It's a story about God and our relationship with him. And we learn about that relationship through the great men and women of our past. And just like them, God wants us to know the will for our lives. And so he made sure to send a love letter to his children. The Bible is a message of grace and forgiveness for all people. It allows God to equip us and to serve us so that we can love and serve others. Genesis 26, 41, God speaks to a man named Isaac. And he says, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Much of the Old Testament are the stories of the foundation of Judaism, Christianity. And here, Isaac is promised that It'll be through his lineage that the Messiah would happen. It would happen through his family. And so in Genesis 25, his wife gives birth to twins. It says, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. The first son born is named Esau, and Esau means hairy. Not Harold. Harold means ruler of the army. <laughs> That's a great boy's name. That's a name of strength. My son is Harold. My son is a warrior, right? No. Esau means my baby is covered in fur, <laughs> right? My baby is a raccoon. Among the Israelites, there's a couple of customs about how you would name a child. One was to name the child after someone, usually a family member, somebody who had died. And so there was a, a practice that you would have a big party and then you would give the child the name of somebody who was admired. And it was a hope that that child would then grab onto those same virtues. And probably later that we started naming uh, Hebrew children after Bible characters. The other tradition 
was to name the child based on an attribute or a quality. And here Esau is named Esau because he is a furry baby. Jacob, the second born, his name means the one who grabs. And so like his brother, his identity has an anchor to his name. And it's kind of weird that even with twins, you have a firstborn and a secondborn, which in a Hebrew family automatically means if you have a child who is the firstborn, then they are the favored one. They are the one who receives the larger portion of the inheritance, the bekorah, or the birthright. It had to do with position and authority. By birthright, the firstborn son inherits the leadership of the family, the judicial authority of his father. Uh, Deuteronomy 21 says that he's also entitled to a double portion of the family's inheritance. So without even trying, you know, with absolutely doing nothing, Esau inherits worth and value. And then Jacob is the lesser just because they were born seconds apart. And true to their names, Esau is favored by his dad. He is the muscular outdoorsman. He lives off the land. He likes to hunt. Jacob is more of an indoors kind of guy. and He is favored by his mother. And so as you can imagine, between brothers, especially ones that are so close, the two of them are always at odds with each other. Even to the point that one day Jacob would trick his brother right out of his birthright. Genesis 25 says, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went away. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Despised is the Hebrew word beza, and it means worthless. And true to his name, Jacob has become the one who grabs. As a second born, Jacob hasn't had everything handed to him simply because he was born first. Everything in his life he has had to claim, and he's learned to take the things that he wants. Years later, their father Isaac lay up in bed, and he thought that he was about to die. Turns out he really didn't, and he ended up dying 40 years later in Genesis chapter 35. But in chapter 27, it says, When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then take your weapons, your quiver and your bow and go out into the field and hunt game for me and prepare for me delicious food such as I love and bring it to me so that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for a game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare my delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare them for delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took his best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth parts of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went in to see his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. 
Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hand. So he blessed him. And he said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring it near me, that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him. And then it says, in Genesis chapter 27, As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, Esau his brother came in from hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me, and I ate all before you came, and I have blessed him? Yes, he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me! Even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you. And verse 41 says, Now Esau Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Jacob had grabbed everything away from his brother. For Esau, there was nothing left. His life was ruined. But for Jacob, the plan kind of also backfired. I'm sure everyone might know the song uh, 500 Miles by the Proclaimers, and it's a very famous chorus. I would walk 500 miles, and I would walk 500 more just to be the man who walks a thousand miles and falls down at your door. Well, for Jacob, it was a 500-mile walk (laughs) from his home in Beersheba to Haran. He, of course, left home to escape his brother's wrath and to find his life. And this became a journey that kept him away from his family and his tribe for almost 20 years. And not only did Jacob end up walking a thousand miles to bring home the woman of his dreams, he also had to work 14 years just to get her to marry him. But he was a young man, right? A strong man. And he had his whole life out ahead of him, right? We always think that uh, this growing period of Jacob's life was in his youth. It's the music montage of of how he grows and matures, right? (laughs) But what I don't think many of us realize is that Jacob is in his 70s when this takes place, when he leaves home. That means he meets the love of his life and marries her when he's 78. Jacob is not a young man, and he doesn't have just a brief life behind him or like a small infraction between him and his brother. No, Jacob had lived a full life, a life of hardship and brokenness and pain and a lifetime of living in his brother's shadow, of not measuring up, of not being the son who was favored, a lifetime of bitterness, a lifetime of having to take things, some things by force, just to make them his own. And for 20 years, He's now in his 90s. He's amassed a family and great flocks and herds. He's carved out a name for himself. He's a self-made man, and he says, now I'm going to go back. And he sends word out to his brother that he's finally coming home. Genesis 32 says, Jacob was alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, 
but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. We've kind of all been there, haven't we? When our past finally catches up with us. Could have been one major event, could have been the turning point of everything, or it could have been a bunch of little minor events. But time does not heal all wounds. Even in your 90s, you can't outrun with it. And you can't outlive it. I mean, don't get me wrong, Jacob does make a wise decision. He is mature in thinking that instead of continuing to run and hide, he should return home. But God shows him, if you really want healing, you have to come face to face. You have to wrestle. As another fall season approaches, we have to ask ourselves if we're going to continue to avoid having those tough conversations. Are we going to continue to avoid the past? Continue to avoid going back? Or are we ready to be face to face? Are we ready to wrestle? What would you have to wrestle with if it were you? A lie you told? A broken relationship? A hurtful conversation you had with somebody? A, a letter that was sent? An addiction? The destructive behavior? Something you said that you wished you could take back? Somewhere back in the past, there is a hurt. But I'm not quite sure even at 90 years old, Jacob has really learned his lesson. Did you notice that when Jacob is wrestling God, he tries to grab another blessing? God says, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have wrestled with God and with men and have prevailed. Even at 90, Jacob is still trying to grab life by the heel and, and to make a name for himself. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised. This is something that we all struggle with, how we find our value, how we find identity, and whatever it is for you, whatever that thing is that gives you value, gives you identity, that's your name, right? Jacob's name was take it. What's yours? Work for it, earn it, prove it. What's your fill in the blank name? We are all in some way not given the blessing we feel we were made for or that we feel we deserve. And we get our wires crossed about where worth comes from. Where, where does your worth come from in life? Maybe to go forward, we first need to go back and get a new blessing and get a new name. Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. And God said, oh, that old trick, Jacob? You know, you've been Jacob for far too long. You need a new name. His new name was Israel. Israel means one who meets with God and is transformed. And it became the name of an entire nation. Can you imagine at 97 years old getting a new name? <laughs> Have you ever thought that the past was just too far in the past? You're too old to change. It's too late for you. Can't turn around now. Can't go back. At 97 years old, Jacob gets a new name. What can you do? First, I would say you need to get your mind back on track. Get your mind back on track. I mean, who, who's responsible for your thoughts? Who? Those memories that you keep reliving, that past that you keep reliving, those voices in your head, who's in charge of all of that? Second Corinthians says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Who? Who destroys? 
We, right? We are responsible for our thoughts. Nobody else. If you're a victim, it's because you've allowed it. It's your choice. It's your responsibility to change it. It says we take every thought captive and we make it obey Christ. The voices you listen to, the thoughts you are telling yourself, whatever you are choosing to believe, it's up to you. Nobody else. Look, nobody else can even hear those voices anyway, right? Only you. You're the only one listening to those voices. So destroy those negative arguments. It's up to you to get your mind back on track. If you're telling yourself that you're broken, then you need to get your mind back on track. Remind yourself, I'm not broken. The cross of Christ did all the work. I am forgiven. The second, you need to take back your community. It's another part of our brokenness. It's the lie that we tell ourselves that we can do it alone. Jacob left his family, left his tribe. He went out and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it on my own. He left his people. He said, I can do it on my own. I don't need them. I hope it doesn't take 97 years for you to realize that you can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. I would, I would never want to do it alone. I, I need you. I need you. I don't, I don't come to church for me. I don't wake up in the morning and think, I don't need to go to church. I'm fine. I come to church for you because I need you in my life. I need community in my life. I need family in my life. First Corinthians says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are all part of the body. We can't do it alone. We all need community to experience the fullness of God's love. We all need community to have others speak truth into us. The, the church was never meant to be something that you did alone. As a church, we want to create those environments for you, those environments of fellowship, to create moments where you meet other people. And third, you need to adopt a new identity in Christ. Revelation says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. You know, that's a very popular thing in the Bible. God loves to give a new name. It's a biblical way of looking at life. Because a new name symbolizes the new opportunity, the new blessing. Isaiah 6 says, The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name. You know, we mentioned Peter earlier, right? He was the disciple who forgot Jesus' teaching about turning the other cheek and <laughs> got a sword out and cut somebody's ear off. <laughs> he was also the disciple that fled when danger came near. He's also the disciple that denied Jesus. And then Jesus says, Simon, you need a new name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rename you Rock. <laughs> Jesus knew his real name because everyone knew who Simon was. Simon was the guy that got frustrated easily. Simon's the guy with a temper. Simon's the guy that was unsure of himself. Simon's the guy that kind of spoke maybe before he thought, and he's the kind of guy that didn't make up his mind very well, and he was unpredictable. But rock, rock means firm. Rock means foundational. Rock means unwavering. Jesus determined that he would use Simon's weakness and his hastiness as something that he could use to change the world, and he named Simon Rock. He said, you're going to be a, a stable, firm foundation. God looks beyond our faults. God looks beyond our weaknesses. He loves us and he expects the very best for us. And I believe he calls all of us to a second chance and a new blessing and a new name. 
We are our own worst critic, aren't we? We're so aware of our weaknesses and so aware of our imperfections and we don't see our strengths as easily. We spend our lives feeling inadequate and we feel guilty and we feel like we're imposters. But Jesus wants to give us a new name, a new purpose, a new blessing. Isaiah 62 says, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Many people think that God is like an angry judge in the clouds who only sees the bad. That he's so aware of your failure, he's so aware of your sin, and he's not as aware of the good in you. And while we're condemning ourselves all that time, God is trying to help us see the good, the grace the forgiveness. 1 John 3 says, if, we, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. See, while we're, we are, while we're calling ourselves failure, God's calling us forgiven. While God is calling us by a new name. John 15 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. Can it be that our names have actually changed and we're still calling ourselves failure all the while God is calling us friend? We're calling ourselves loser? And God is calling us beloved? We're calling ourselves sinner? And God is calling us saint? God is giving us a new chance and a new lease on life and a new name. No matter how many times we fail, Because God loves a new blessing. God loves a new name. And God's new name for you is a new beginning. There were those in the world that were tax collectors. Jesus called them disciples. There were those that were called sinners. And Jesus called them companions. There were those that were shamed. They were immoral. God called them forgiven. There were those that were fishermen. And Jesus said, you are fishers of men. A crucified thief. Jesus said, you are now an heir of paradise. What names have you been called in the past? What names have you called yourself? Jesus Christ wants to offer you a new blessing. He wants to offer you a new way of looking at life and a new name. Can you close your eyes with me? It's not a prayer. This is just you doing a little bit of a inward look. What is your name? Your given name, the name you've been called all your life, and those nicknames that you were given by your uncle or your mother, or that name you were called on the playground, those words that molded you and shaped you as you grew, that identity the hurtful things that you've been called, the shame that's been cast around you. Whatever it says carved into that name tag, whatever it says written on that sticker that's on your shirt, your name, know that your Heavenly Father wants to give you a new name. Your name is loved. Your name is redeemed. Your name is beloved daughter. Your name is son of worth. Your name is accepted. 
Your name is Grace Covered. There is a new name given to you by God, written on your heart. A new name on a white stone given only to you. Receive that new name. Receive that blessing. Lord God, however I walked in here, I want to leave transformed. The person that I was when I walked through those doors, I have sat now and wrestled with you. I want to leave different. I want to leave new. And whether I'm 45 or 75 or 95, I know that I have blessing and future ahead of me, a new life, a new blessing, and a new name. And if I have to go back some more and do some more wrestling, perhaps with somebody in my family or someone close to me, if there's a phone call I need to make or a conversation I need to take, Lord, go back with me. Help me to wrestle with that and to accept my new blessing, to accept a new name so that I can go forward. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to, to have this summer and to be able to share these different messages with you. Of course, I want to remind you that we are here. We are here in the sanctuary every Sunday. Uh, we'd love to see you. We have plenty of room for you, and we can't wait to see you. Uh, we have two services. One is at 9.30. It's a traditional service, and we're going to sing all of your favorite hymns. We sing the doxology, we do responsive readings, we say the Lord's Prayer. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a more contemporary service. Please come as you are. There's no need to dress up or to put on airs. Please be yourself. It's also the service where we have our full children's program from preschool all the way through high school. And we have a youth group that meets every single week, and we'd love your kids to be a part of it. You can always find us at waldenchurch.com or you can reach out to us through one of our social media pages. Thank you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.